so happy on this Bears Week One Victory Week to have uh, guests back on that we really enjoyed last year. Um, everybody, welcome Infante to Bear Ski Film. Yeah, and I, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hurt <laughs> someone. How dare you use my <laughs> last name? How dare you? Bears Victory Week. Um, it was an interesting game. I, I just want to get your initial thoughts on it. Uh, how, how are you feeling on this Wednesday? I mean, all things considered, I'm feeling pretty good. I choose to look at it through the lens of the Bears played that poorly on offense and still won. So I'm curious to see how they do when the offense finally shows up. And part of that may be the Titans just aren't very good. Part of that may be just, you know, circumstantial. But at the same time, if the defense shows up, you know, you get a you know a lucky player two on special teams every once in a while, you're, you're going to be in a lot of games. Some things that happen on offense I'm not too happy about. But it's week one. It's a victory. I can't be mad at a win just because of how many times the Bears have lost over the years. Most of the years that I've been a Bears fan, they've been under 500. So, uh, you know, I'm definitely not complaining. Do you have any positive takeaways to take away from the offensive performance? Yeah, so I will say uh, I think the tackles performed well, the offensive tackles. Braxton Jones, Darnell Wright showcased some, you know, intriguing stuff, I think. Darnell, especially, I went back and uh, I'm doing a like a segment of five scouting reports that I do for each week uh, over on my Patreon. And Darnell Wright was one of the guys that I watched this week and that I broke down. And I was I came away really impressed. I mean, obviously, you saw the strength, you see the nasty demeanor, but just how athletic he is uh, for someone who's listed at over 330 pounds. Uh, I think that both the tackles look good and – even though they took him out, I thought Nate Davis was solid. You know, I'm not saying, oh, he looked like an all-pro guard out there because that's not the case. You know, he got beat on, a, you know, like probably two plays. But, you know, he looked quick. He looked, you know, polished, uh, which I think was definitely encouraging. So I don't think, you know, Coleman Shelton didn't do well. Tevin Jenkins didn't do well. But I do think that, you know, some of the offensive line, put together a solid outing. O-line is just one of those things where it's like, you're as good as your worst player. And when one guy does bad, you know, there's only so much you can do to mask it. So yeah, I'd, I'd say the offensive line, p- pieces of the offensive line, I think were uh, encouraging on Sunday. David, what about you? You got any positive takeaways from the offensive performance? I, I think it's only up from here, right? So um, in terms of performance from like the skill position guys and everything, other than everybody being hurt, on some medium level early on in the season, I think we're definitely going to see only up. I heard an interesting take in terms of the Texans game to this weekend, and it's really just more of a uh, throw the kitchen sink and there's not much of expected from you this weekend. So kind of just experiment and see what works. There's some more questions I would have for Jacob just because I consider him like an awesome film guy. Do you think Ryan Bates being at center would have changed much in terms of like the offensive line construction and the, like the rotation and everything. I think Tevin Jenkins overall had a bad game per se. And uh, there's just some still like, but there's still some personality stuff from Tevin, Tevin Jenkins. That's just indisputable, right? Like even the fault, like the lost fumble, Tevin Jenkins was the guy that hopped on it because he's always hustling towards the ball. He's always hustling towards the end of the play. Things yeah. like that always interest me in terms of the hustle stuff and like the, me and Paul, you have said this year is very much an eye test season. It's not so much a, you know, results based season. We both have them at nine wins, but to me, I think the Titans, yeah, they're, they're not great, but they're still in that like 20 to 17 range, right? Like in terms of the best teams in the NFL, they're not going to drop off below the twenties. They're still a pretty good team. They're in the AFC South. They're going to win some games like Jeffrey Simmons and Tavondre Sweat are probably going to be one of the top interior defensive line combos like what do you feel like coleman shelton i I don't know i I, this is a question down the line but like how do you feel like ryan bates sliding in at center maybe keeping nate davis and putting your best guys out there does for this line i think that's an interesting question and i think part of why coleman shelton performed poorly was just due to the matchup he had so going up against uh you know tavandre sweat for a majority of his reps with you know, such a big body. Uh, Coleman Shelton's a little bit smaller for a center. I think that, sure, you know, ideally you'd like to get a little bit of help in from the guard, but there are some times where you just have to have the center uh, one-on-one with the, you know, the nose tackle or the, uh, you know, the one tech, depending on how they align them. I think that part of that came down to matchup, but 
I do think that, you know, I, put, I mean, Coleman Shelton didn't do very well. I, I'm just going to put it like that. That's not a very high bar for Ryan Bates to reach if they did have him at center. Uh, I didn't think he was amazing at right guard when I watched him. So, I mean, all things considered, though, I do think that, you know, it's a pretty low bar that, uh, you know, that Coleman Shelton set for his performance. I'm not going to sit here and say that that's indicative of how he's going to do every single week. But just naturally with a smaller center, it's going to be tougher for them to do well against some of those, you know, big bodies, let alone someone like Tavondre Sweat, who, you know, is quicker than you'd expect for a guy who's like, what, 340, 350. Uh, and, you know, he's got a nice arsenal of oh. you know, techniques you can use to shed blocks. So. I, think, I think at Texas, he was he was listed at like 380, 400 almost at Texas. So, like, he's a, he's a yeah. massive man. He's ridiculous. The other part I found interesting was, a uh, twofold kind of thing is that Coleman Shelton, even from Rams tape when the Bears signed him, he was never a bull rush, pass rush, yeah. you know, lock in guy, like plant your feet and hold that center line up. He's definitely one of those guys. And I, that kind of goes into my second point is I remember just watching a Jason Kelsey video where he says, you know, center is the easiest position to play on the field. It's the most mentally grueling, right? Yeah. But physically it's, you're always getting guard help. You're always getting an A gap help. You're always getting an A gap help here. And I just think that game plan wise, that was just not a really good plan for Coleman Shelton, whether that's the offense, just kind of not expecting Tavondre Sweat to be that good. I mean, he was second round pick, but he was highly overdrafted based on projections. He was probably like a third or fourth round guy, I think. Yeah, like I think that's just not Coleman Shelton's game. And I think they put him in bad situations, but maybe considering that what they did was a bad situation, maybe next week he'll do better, but yeah, I, I like your positives much more than than my own because they're not they're not plentiful. <laughs> so. Well, my positive takeaways from the offensive performance were very simple. Uh, you just didn't lose the game. I mean, you didn't you didn't fumble, you didn't intercept the ball. You, you know, it didn't look great. You weren't out there converting many third downs. I think uh, it was like a fifteen percent third down conversion. Two for 14, I think. If it's yeah, two for specific. 14 sounds about right. Um, but you got, I believe, two out of two fourth downs. Um, so when it mattered, you converted the fourth downs. You got the two extra points. And, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's game one for rookies. So I was just happy that as bad as it looked, at least it wasn't completely game killing. You know, you throw an interception, you throw a pick six, you fumble the ball. And, and that could have been the game. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, just because of how close it was and, you know, the miracle style of a comeback that it was, um, if you would have made it any harder to do, it might have not happened. Who do you feel deserves more credit for that comeback? Would it, would it be the players or would it be the coaching staff? Or is it just like an even distribution? That's a good question. I'd say it's a fairly even distribution. I mean, honestly, I'd say you can scheme as much as you want, but it's a, you know, you need to have good players out there. You need your players to execute on those assignments that your coaches have. So I think that the defense deserves a lot of credit. I think the defensive line played a lot better than, you know, I was expecting. I'm sure many people were expecting the secondary looked really good. Jalen Johnson was incredible. Tyreek Stevenson had the pick six and, you know, it had another PBU on top of that. So I'd say I'd lean the players, but I'd also give credit to the defensive scheme. I think that, especially when you go back with how things started with Eberflus, with uh, Alan Williams as defensive coordinator, you know, the defense was pretty passive and, you know, the, the zone coverage was soft. And that's something that we're not seeing as much of. I think part of that comes down to play calling. Part of that comes down to, you know, smarter and more aggressive cornerbacks I, I definitely give credit to the coaching but i think you know the players uh you know they're the ones that went out and executed so i got to give the hats off to them as well i feel like you saw a lot of that shell coverage in the first half and they kind yeah. of went away from it in the second half that shell coverage was really what like tony pollard was just feasting on those linebackers yeah. backpedaling towards that first half and then towards the second half they were just like you know what screw it man like let's these let's let these corners do what they do and yeah. play these like man-to-man -man matchups they're these aren't elite level corners and it kind of gives me confidence towards the Texans game. And if you got to give Eberflus credit towards one thing and it's, it's these adjustments he's been kind of making in his career. It's not, they're not as quick as I'd like them to be. They're not bill Belichick esque where they're game to game. Even when you talk about the Justin Fields adjustment, I'd give more credit to that to Luke, Matt Eberflus than Luke Getze. When we're talking about like when he did that Washington game in his in, uh, field second year, 
right? When they had the mini buy and that changed the season and the, they started running a lot more RPOs. I think Eberflus is a lot more flexible than, than maybe some of his under staff is. And yeah, I think matchups against Texas, uh, against Houston, I think you you got to play some man-to-man. And like you said, that defensive line was like a super pleasant surprise. I think Demarcus Walker had a hell of a game. I think uh, Darrell Taylor, Taylor uh, obviously had an amazing game. And then the defensive interior was not nearly as bad as we chalked it up to be. I, I almost look at it as we don't need Trey Hendrickson, even though I think the Bengals are going to suck kind of thing. You know, I, I, I found it interesting when you hear Matt Eberflus talk about halftime when he went into the locker room. And he said the players were out there uh, talking between themselves, saying, hey, we got this game. We're not going to lose this game, this and that. I think that shows the maturity of the soccer room growing and growing a lot. I know last year when we were, you know, set up to potentially draft Jalen Carter, one of the things Ryan Poles mentioned is he wasn't sure if the locker room is – in the right place to have a guy with potential character issues. And so I think just one year later, I feel a lot different about the leadership on this team. I mean, we saw them name eight guys captain and things like that. So for me, you know, I think you have to give the coaches credit because, well, they didn't repeat the same mistakes last that they did last year. They didn't go. Oh, and one potentially Oh, and two Oh, and four, you know, we started off one and all and that that's important, but the players deserve all the praise in my opinion. I'm sick of seeing miracles for other teams and whether they're scheme based or something that can be replicated, sometimes just winning is something that like boosts players confidence. It's a weird sport with a lot of like momentum and, and, and feeling and stuff like that. Like I feel much better going into the Texans game then I think I should. The The team doesn't feel like a bunch of losers. I think if they start 0-1 and, and they have no sense of a comeback and that game ends 35-10, to 10, I'm, I'm absolutely 100% locking in a Texans victory. I think there's something to that. Whereas now I, I do feel a bit of a chance. I think 6.5 on the money line is kind of like a weird number. I, I don't think that it's an impossible game to win. Whereas at halftime, I was like, yeah, we're done. You have a guy in Caleb Williams who's played Superman his whole life. Like his college team wasn't going to bail him out of that situation. Right. So for him to come into his first NFL game and struggle and still come away with the victory, I think might help him calm down a little bit and kind of realize like, hey, I have a team to lean on. He just hasn't experienced that in his uh, college career very much at all. I think that's uh, definitely fair, honestly. I mean, you go back and watch USC games, uh, the defense didn't really do all that much to keep them in games. It was usually, all right, Caleb, our defense just scored a touchdown. Keep us in the game. And that's something that would happen over and over and over again. You put all that weight on Caleb and he was able to, you know, he was able to succeed. It's a different game in the NFL. You know, the hope is eventually he can be that guy where it doesn't matter what's around him. He's going to be able to elevate what's around him. But the fact is he's a rookie right now. You shouldn't expect that. So I agree. I think that whether it was, you know, old habits of I need to be Superman, whether it was, you know, jitters about uh, you know this being his first game, you know, whether it was chemistry with the receivers still getting used to, whatever the case may be, I think that a lot of those issues are fixable. I think the arm talent still showed up. The athleticism still showed up. And he was, I think, a good decision maker. I think that's something that's not being talked about enough is he didn't make too many uh, dumb decisions with the football. I mean, every once in a while, you know, he had that scramble where he'd, you know, go back like 15 yards for no reason. But when he was throwing the ball, he was pretty smart with it. Like he didn't make any bad throws that were into double coverage or anything like that. And he just, you know, he just simply missed a couple guys. So I think that the accuracy is something that's going to come in time because simply you watched USC. He's, he was a very accurate passer there. I, you know, I have no reason to think that all, all of a sudden he doesn't know how to throw a football. I just think it's, you know, a different game, uh, different situations. And yeah, it definitely for him, I feel like it'd be a uh, very, very relieving to see like, Hey, my defense can keep me in this game. My special teams can make a play every once in a while. My team is going to be able to be good enough to where I don't have to do everything by myself. If, if I'm Caleb, I'm breathing a sigh of relief and just being like, okay, you know, now I can, you know, now I can play my game. Yeah. I personally have like more positives to gain from Caleb Williams performance than I think a lot of people maybe want to just nitpick and 
say he's bad. I don't think there's been a general consensus that his performance is bad. I would like to think, but two of the things that stood out to me was uh, pop time. PFF had him graded as the quickest release in terms of snap to to throw. So the decision making is there. It was 2.04 seconds versus Justin Fields average of like 2.98. It's a whole full second faster. So whether or not the, the scheme is right or wherever, whoever's open, he's making the decision quickly. And then the other part is me and Paulie have said forever. This is my concern with uh, hiring uh, Indianapolis Colts play, uh, coaching staff and the players. Uh, football is not a game of nice guys. Sometimes you need some a couple of assholes on your team that are just competitive as hell. And Jeffrey Simmons talking shit at Caleb Williams towards the end of the game. And Caleb Williams only response is scoreboard. Right. Like that to me is just one of those things, as you guys said, like Caleb Williams is used to having to drag the corpse of the USC defense across the finish line and to be so confident in week one where he's underperforming and doing really poorly. And somebody's talking shit and it's like an all pro Jeffrey Simmons talking shit that you're underperforming, you're doing bad. And he's just like, oh, yeah, we're winning. I don't give a fuck. Like, that's awesome to me. I want an I want like a confident asshole on my team that's gonna like drag this team across the finish line. I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, especially like Ryan Pohl said, you know, you want to be able to set that culture in place. And I'd rather draft an asshole or sign an asshole and then bring him into the fold, you know, after the fact, after you've established this winning culture and this mentality. But to have someone every once in a while who's going to push some buttons, you know, I think that's – it's a lot of fun to have. So, uh, me personally, I'm all here for it. And, you know, they are who we thought they were, right? Like, we've seen this as Bears fans over and over, This these type of wins where the defense and special teams just leads the way. And wins are great, right? We'll always take them. Like, there's, there's no way – I prefer to lose this game by any means. We did come out of it with some hints at some problems to come that are probably going to linger on throughout the season. And so uh, what are some of those lingering issues in your opinion? And do you think that it, they can be fixed this season during the season? Yeah. So I think as far as lingering issues go, uh, I mean, obviously I'd say the interior offensive line, uh, I alluded to it a little bit earlier in the show where, you know, Ryan Bates was okay. Uh, you know, Nate Davis, I thought was solid, but Coleman Shelton wasn't very good. Uh, Tevin Jenkins, you know, wasn't very good. And I thought last year he was their best offensive lineman on the team. So for that to take place, you know, it's not great. I mean, obviously, you know, that to Vondre Sweat, I spoke to his abilities, Jeffrey Simmons being a very good player. It's a, you know, difficult matchup, but I think that uh, you know, I, I want to be able to see how they'll do against other teams now as well. Houston, you know, they're built a little bit differently. They don't have like elite interior defensive linemen, but they have two really good edge rushers in Will Anderson and Daniil Hunter. So I'm curious to see how maybe a differently designed defensive line is going to affect the Bears. And if the if the tackles can keep up the same level of play that they did last week then I think they'll be in really good shape just because they looked good. And, you know, I, you know, hypothetically the interior offensive lines facing a bit of a, uh, you know, a bit of lesser competition, so to speak, I think it could turn out very well for them. There's definitely, I mean, I'm, I'm nervous about it a little bit for sure. I think that, you know, it makes sense just given, you know, they didn't necessarily perform all that well. Interior line is definitely a point for concern. And that's just kind of more into the, into the structure and the roster construction of this team. And I, I don't know if it's a Ryan pulls arrogance thing or, or what, but just to ignore that interior line position moving forward is kind of alarming. I think my biggest concerns are just kind of the, the personnel groupings, what is going on. And me and Paulie's biggest issue last season with Luke Getze is that the offense always wanted to be the smartest guy in the room. And rarely, rarely, rarely in the NFL does that ever work. Sometimes it's just a game of your guy is better than my guy. My guy is better than your guy. And the fact that the best five players on the Chicago Bears, in my opinion, and what most people consider is like Keenan Allen, DJ Moore, Roma Dunze, Cole Komet, DeAndre Swift. That combination of the best five guys out there was out for 10 plays out of 62. And that to me makes no sense. Did you see anything there in terms of like matchups? Is 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 Shane Waldron just trying to be smarter than everybody? Is he just stuck to his system? Like what is going on there? 
Yeah, so I'd say I was definitely surprised a little bit with some of the personnel groupings. I think one in particular that Gerald Everett got more snaps than Cole Komet. And, you know, I, I like Gerald Everett. I think he's a solid player, all things considered. Uh, I just don't know necessarily, you know, I don't think he's better than Cole Komet. And, you know, Everett, they like lining him up uh, out wide. So, you know, you can have, you know, someone like DJ Moore, Keenan Allen, Odunze in the slot. Uh, potentially utilize that as a mismatch. And, you know, you've got Legereus Sneed on the outside for the Titans. You know, maybe that was part of it. But I think Everett's a little more athletic than Komet, but I still think overall Komet's the better player. So my guess is it was more matchup aligned. Uh, I mean, we'll have to see in these next coming weeks how that snap count changes. I'd like to see more of Komet on the field. I'd love to, you know, love to see more of that. Like you said, though, you know, that 11 personnel with Cole Komet, DeAndre Swift, and then the top three receivers, uh, you know, that's something I want to see. So I'm going to be curious to uh, figure out exactly, you know, how that's going to happen. My guess is it was just the matchup, but I mean, we'll, you know, I guess we'll just have to wait and see.